So today is just a time for you guys to ask all your questions. And we posted this outline yesterday that we created from the lecture slides that gives it some structure to, to understand the slides from because they're too many and too detailed. Um, we didn't really eliminate anything directly because the same lectures are being tested on the final as well. So it's kind of like we don't want to say that, oh, we will never ask a question on this and then ask it later in the midterm or in the final. So this is like a comprehensive list of topics that we thought we covered in class. And if you think we didn't, then you can ask us for clarifications and we'll talk more about those. Um, and then I already discussed the format of the exam, right? Or question. I'll repeat the questions this time. So just remind me to repeat for the people who aren't here. Yeah. That's a great question. So the question is how much physiology we do we need to know that we didn't explicitly cover in this class because the emphasis was more about application of that physiology. So we do have some direct physiology questions, but most of them are kind of hidden in the form of um, questions that, that focus on the disorders that we studied. So for example, like when the first homework had a question on labradin and myasthenia gravis, that was a little hard, but that would be an example of using a disease to test the physiology of the synaptic junction. You know, That would be an example of that. For the cardiac system, for example, I didn't really explicitly cover that the blood flows from the left atrium to the left ventricle through the mitral valve, but that is something that you're expected to know. Like if you don't understand the valves and the ventricles and where the blood flows, then you might not be able to answer the questions that the exam asks, because they might specifically refer to the aortic valve being stenotic and then what happens to blood flow. So you really need to know where the aortic valve is and what it does to be able to understand what will happen if it's not working properly. So physiology at that level is, is necessary. In terms of like other stuff, for example, GI physiology, we didn't cover like many hormones in details, and you might have covered those in previous classes. We won't test that specifically. Like so if we didn't mention the functions of one of the gastric hormones in explicit detail in the lecture, we won't ask you specifically what is the function of this hormone. But if we covered it in a lecture, then we can ask you that question directly. Does it make sense? Yeah. Right. Uh, so the midterm is short. It's like 75 minutes, like short for you guys as in time-wise. You only have 75 minutes to do it. So the questions are more or less direct. Um, and if you give me an example of complex graphs, I can tell you whether or not that's something that's, you know, exam type of material. But. like in the obesity lecture with the GI thing? Well, that's, I think, if you look at that figure closely, it's actually not that detailed. It just says which organs produce them and where they act. So I think that much is fair game. Uh, same thing with like endocrine. Endocrine system has the feedback loops for the various axes, right? The pituitary system or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, like those three-step things, those are totally fair game. In general, though, when we write questions on feedback loops to give you some information about the loop before you have to answer the question. Or we oftentimes will draw the loop for you, but not necessarily. Any other questions before we go? OK, so I thought I also heard someone talk about equations and derivations. Uh, you're not going to be asked to derive anything on the midterm, at least, because it's short. However, any equation that, that's covered in class, uh, we could ask you to do something with it. Not derive it further, but like understand it or manipulate it a little bit. So that's fine. But I know the homework questions have lots of derivations and detailed explanations and answers. That's, that's the level of difficulty that we won't be asking for the exam. Because you get three weeks to do the homework, but you're in class for the exam. And you can't take it home and look things up. Does it help? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. So question number nine from the midterm of last year, which is like this complex uh, absorption of nutrients equation thing, will not be on the midterm. That type of question could show up in the final, where you have three hours and you have some time to think about 
things. In the midterm, it's gonna be much simpler, shorter. Uh, the format is basically multiple choice questions with A, B, C, or A, B, C, D for the most part, true or false here and there, and then very short answer questions where the answer is literally one word or two words for the question. You know, like you get a small clinical presentation and you're like, what is the diagnosis? And they're gonna be very fairly obvious. They're not gonna be like strange diagnoses that you haven't seen. So that's kind of like the one word answers. And then there's a couple of uh, sh very short questions, but that require a reason. So it's like, blah, blah, blah happens, why? So it's like a one line answer. You don't have to write like a page to explain why. So it's like short reasoning questions. And then there are three or four questions that might be a little bit longer, like worth three or four points where you have to actually write three sentences or four sentences. Uh, they could be a little bit drawing here and there, uh, one or two you know, small figures that might be easy to draw by yourself, like nothing crazy. Uh, people ask you to draw like the GI system or draw the cardiac system kind of thing. That's not what we're testing in this class. Something application oriented given a question. Uh, and then equations will be on it, but like not deriving the equation or not like creating complex equations out of a simple equation like that one. It's mostly going to be like, well, the resistance is equal to blah, blah, blah of something, you know? And you have to just use a simple formula. That's in the slides, so nothing beyond the slides. No. There might be like one small calculation, but it's literally like 40 minus 20, so I think most people can do that in their head. Yeah. Yeah. So no calculators. No case studies. No, it's because it's in the lecture already. Whatever we're asking is in the lecture slide. So don't, you don't have to study the case studies for the exam. The homework, MATLAB, is totally not on the exam as well. Nothing about MATLAB is on the exam. Uh, so no case studies, no MATLAB, and yeah. The other homework stuff is like good to think about, but those questions are harder than the questions on the exam. Like the problem set two, parts A to D. We do have answers, we don't post them, so you can email us your answers and we'll let you know if they're right, or you can come to office hours and we can go over them with you. It's just course policy, we don't post exam answers so that if you wanna reuse the questions later, uh, we can reuse them without having people cycle them over to next year's. But we're happy to share the answers with you in person. Huh? Of what? You mean give you guys paper copies of the answers? But people can do the same thing. They can go and scan them or, pho or uh, photocopy them. But if you come to office hours just to look at them and we have the copy, yeah, we can do that. But you can't take it with you or take pictures of them or anything. Yep, 10 points for lecture. It's gonna be exactly, it's gonna be even for this. Any other questions on actual content? Anything about your note sheets, like one side, you can write anything you want. So, so some of the topics, I'll just like scroll through this. Obviously I can't go over all these like things in today's lecture, but if you see something that you think you need more information on, then just point out. So anything, do you think anything from the CNS part that you want more info on? If you also want, we can skip this and we can go over some of the final exam questions, the sample final that we posted and I can tell you the answers for those that we can work through them because some of them are pretty relevant for the exam. You wanna do that? Okay, yeah, let's do that. Question. Yeah. I think if you pick the most common one or two treatments for the disease, it's probably enough. Also for conditions that don't have treatments or that are just like speculated research treatments, we probably won't ask those. We'll probably ask diseases that actually have direct treatments that were mentioned in lecture that are fairly straightforward to match or figure out. Not, it's, not gonna, it's not meant to confuse you or trick you. The exam is really straightforward. It's just meant to see whether you went through all the lectures uh, enough.
you guys have to do this too? Okay. So we don't have clickers or anything, so you guys just have to participate, because I don't want to just stand here and read the answers out. I want you guys to guess the answers of the questions, and then we can quickly go over as many of these as we can, so you don't have to come to office hours. And you can note down the answers. Um, all right, so let's start with GI and microbiome. Can you guys read that, or should I magnify it? Is that good? Okay. So in what form does fat leave the intestines after it's digested and absorbed? This is like a, it's probably on the slides, but this might be more emphasized last year than this year. Anyone know? If, yeah, it is on the slides. Yeah. Yeah, so chylomicron, that's C. So, I mean, there's not much I can explain about this except for the fact that that's how digestion happens. So give two examples of normal gut colonizers that can also cause disease in humans. Yes, E. coli is like the perfect example of it. That's great. What else? H. pylori. Excellent. So these are quite simple. And this one has it as four points, but it's just don't worry about the point values. It would actually be two points on this exam. Everything's like linear. So one, one word, one, at, one point kind of thing. What is the mechanism of Hirschsprung disease? Do you remember Hirschsprung disease from um, the GI system? We covered it in class, I think. Yeah, so anyone know the answer? Yeah, so the la latter part of the colon usually lacks the neural innervation in the, because the intestine has its own neural system in two layers, the Meissner's plexus and the, uh, what's the other one? My enteric plexus, so both of them are missing. And so because of that, the intestine can't contract because the nerves help the intestine contract, so the intestine just keeps becoming bigger and bigger and people can't pass, babies can't pass stool. So it's like a genetic disease. You find it out very early in child, very early in infancy. So next question is name the three different types of bariatric surgery and include one that is the gold standard. Or like which one of those is the gold standard? There's actually four covered in lecture, right? Anyone know the names of those? Yep. Good. Gastric band. What else? Yeah. Who and why? Well, I don't know if I'd use the word tummy tuck. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's plastic kind of thing, I think. Duodenal switch, right? So we got gastric band, gastric bypass, uh, duodenal switch, and then who and why. Which one of these is the gold standard? Who and why? There you go. So it's going to be very straightforward questions like this, where the answers are direct and not confusing. So a patient with severe Crohn's disease, which was an inflammatory bowel disease, that is refractory to medical intervention, that means the drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs that we use is not helping, they undergo a duoden duodeno ileal resection. So taking part of the duodenum and the ileum out. So do you know the parts of the small intestine? Uh, intestine? What are they? Duodenum, jejunum, ileum, right? So, this person had part of the small intestine res resected. Uh, why would she subsequently have fatty stool? Yep. Yeah. Because where? What organ does lipase come from? Sorry, it's not. Did you say B or D? I didn't hear it. B, yeah, B is the answer, not D. Um, so deficiency of lipase is wrong, because lipase is produced by the pancreas, and we didn't do anything to it. So lipase is being produced. Bile is being produced by what? Liver. So that's fine. And then we've got inability to transport chylomicrons out of the intestinal cells. Now, whatever intestinal cell is remaining, that should be able to transport the chylomicron. It's actually inability to form the um, 
micelles, or however you say it, micelles, some people say micelles, some say micelles, is the answer for having fatty stool, because then the fat can't just be coated, and then it gets secreted out in fatty stool, so the stool looks really oily and fatty. You can actually see the oil covering the toilet bowl water in these patients oftentimes. Okay, anyone know the difference? Yeah, questions? So the fat digestion and absorption happens in the small intestine in, in this area. So when this area goes away, the fats aren't processed appropriately enough to be absorbed later. Yeah, yeah, so, <clears throat> and that brings out lots of other complications, but one of the things is the fats, they're not being able to be coated and absorbed properly. Even though the, the rest of the intestine has the absorptive area, the fats need to be processed before then, ahead of time, to be able to be absorbed as chylomicrons, which doesn't happen. So, what, are the, what is the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetics? Versus what? Yeah, so type 1 doesn't make any insulin. It's kind of like, think of the pancreas beta cells burning out in, an, in younger ages. That they have autoimmune conditions, the antibodies attack the pancreatic tissue, and then those kids can't make any insulin anymore. Type 2 diabetics are usually older people, but now in the age of obesity, younger and younger people um, who over time become insulin resistant. That is, their insulin isn't good enough to pump the glucose in the cells. So they essentially, slowly and gradually over time, will burn out their pancreas and also become insulin dependent. But initially, they're just like insulin resistance and burning out slowly. Yeah, type 1 is autoimmune destruction of beta cells. Type 2 is insulin resistance, as one of your classmates pointed out. And type 1 kids always get insulin because they can't use any of the other drugs, whereas type 2s can get other drugs orally, which will insulin sensitize them to reverse or to account for the insulin resistance, which is not possible. But eventually, you'll see older type 2 diabetics, like if you have any grandparents with diabetes, some of them might be on insulin, even though they're not type 1 diabetics, because over time, the pancreas will burn out by itself from overworking. So if a diabetic patient comes to the clinic, and no blood glucose meters are available, the finger sticks one. How can you objectively measure the patient's blood glucose level and uh, explain why you were able to measure this? Yes. Yes, correct. Correct. So usually glucose is one of the things that technically gets fully absorbed in the kidney. Remember that graph that we had in the class with a multiple choice question? So what happens when there's too much glucose is all the glucose transporters in the kidney that are absorbing this glucose get filled up. So if they get filled up, then you have all this extra glucose that has nowhere to go but the urine. So you can detect it in urine if it's high enough. Yeah. So you can actually, there are scales to convert, and he's right that for the glucose to enter the urine, it already has to be above higher than a certain amount. So obviously, it won't give you the difference between like 100 versus 200, but above values like 250, 300, then you can start to correlate that. And I think there's scales uh, on urine dips and other things that can help quantify that. So it is still objective, but in a different range. It's, already, it's objective in a range that's already quite high. But you know, urine is the answer here. We, can, we don't have eye contact lenses yet, but maybe in the future we'll have those. All right, so we didn't cover blood stuff yet. We can save that for the final. We didn't cover reproductive, but let's do endocrine parts of this. Which of the following is expected in Graves' disease? Decreased triidothyronin, which is T3. Decreased TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Decreased thyroxine, which is T4. Decrease iodide, which is just the nutrient, and then A and C. Oh, okay. So, yeah, of course. I mean, I don't know what exactly he called them or not, but usually when we write questions, we give you descriptions. We won't give you fancy words. We don't believe in that. So it'll be fine. 
I can assure you, you won't have crazy words like this show up if you, if you haven't seen them in detail. So I'll tell you, A is a thyroid hormone, C is a thyroid hormone, B is thyroid stimulating hormone, which you should know, and then D is iodide, which is just a nutrient, which is used to form the thyroid hormone. So which of them is going to be decreased in Graves' disease? I think the other thing is, do you know what Graves' disease is? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. that's... Hyper, yeah. Question. Well, that's what James was trying to explain. You want to draw that? So if you have high thyroid hormone, what happens to your feedback loop? What does it do? Yeah. So because you have a lot of this, what would you expect your kidney to do? Yeah, so that's the answer. That's the issue, right? The thyroid is kind of doing what it does. It's kind of the disease state of Graves' disease where it keeps producing thyroid hormone regardless of the stimulation. But the body's response to that is, oh crap, I have so much thyroid hormone, what do I do? So the body tries to shut down its normal production, but the abnormal production still continues. That's the disease, unless you fix it. So the hormones will always be high. Iodide generally doesn't go low or anything because it's a micronutrient, we have enough of it. It's in endemic countries with like poor nutrition, in developing countries and children, iodine can be really low and can run out really quick, but they often have the problem of hypothyroidism before something like this can even develop because they don't even have iodine in their diet. That's why we all have iodized salt, so we have plenty of iodine. Yeah. So there's two things. One is a radioactive iodine uptake thing. So you just give a little bit thing, and then you just image the gland. And if the gland takes up too much iodine, then you know the gland is using up too much iodine for. Because we have enough, and it doesn't become that low. Because it's, it's, it's not used in enough quantities to actually see a difference. Because we have a lot of iodine in our diet. Yeah not decreasing to any significant levels. Like you're not becoming iodine deficient at all in this condition because we have enough iodine in our diet. Uh, someone else might in a developing country like a one-year-old might, but we won't in the US. So it's not a problem for us. But one is an uptake scan which tells you how much is working and uptaking. And the other one is a radioactive iodine therapy where you give enough to burn or to radiate the thyroid gland locally. What about increased TSH would be expected in patients with what? So we already determined Graves was decreased TSH, right? What about, let's go one by one. So let's start with D. We decrease TRH. What's TRH? 
So all of the endocrine things have hypothalamic, pituitary, and then end, end gland axis. So it's always a three axis, and you should remember all three. So in this case, the third axis that he's drawing now is hypothalamus secreting TRH to the pituitary. So think of it this way. Grandfather tells the father to produce a TSH. The, TS, the child is basically a T3, T4. So it goes TRH, TSH, T3, T4. So that also exerts a negative thing. So if you have too much T3, T4, you're going to actually lower the TRH as well, right? So since this is increased TSH, we know that D isn't right. We already know A isn't right because A decreases TSH based on the previous question. What happens when you take too much thyroxine over the counter to lose weight artificially? Or it's not over the counter, sorry, prescription med. Yeah, it's, it's, illegal. it's technically illegal to do it, but people have done it. Yeah, yeah. It's T4, actually, but yeah. For practical purposes, thyroid hormone. What does it do to TSH and TRH? Decrease. So we know that A decreases, C decreases, D decreases. So then B is the only answer. And Hashimoto's disease is just a fancy name for autoimmune hypothyroidism when your thyroid gland gets attacked, just like the insulin type 1, where the pancreas gets attacked by antibodies. In Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it's the antibodies that attack the thyroid gland. So I don't know if we covered the names of these in detail, but like you could be asked that same question without giving all these fancy names and just be able to interpret the TSH, TRH, and the thyroid hormones. Well, that's the question. Yeah, increase DSH. Yeah, yeah. In in hypothyroidism like Hashimoto's, what would TRH be? We already said TSH would be increased. It would be high, right? Because low should up increase it. So that's the point. I think for each endocrine, we have the loops in, in lecture. I think you should look at those feedback loops because that's how all the reasoning questions are going to be answered is based on what these loops do. 16 is B. We won't do the menstrual cycle. We'll leave that for the final exam. We won't do polysmermy. OK, so CNS, PNS, MSK, we've covered those. So explain how contrast is generated in a functional MRI. I think we had a question on that in the homework, too, I think. So does anyone remember functional MRI imaging from? Yeah, so there's hemoglobin is oxygenated and deoxygenated, right? So what happens is uh, oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin have different magnetic susceptibilities, and MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. So this basically serves as an MRI contrast uh, in functional MRI. And then you can see the areas of the brain that are really active and working metabolically have a lot of um, usage of blood, right? Because if you're, if you're like using one area of the brain too much at a time, it gets more blood supply. So it has more oxyhemoglobin than deoxyhemoglobin, and that lights up on the scan. So that's why, like, that's how people study, like, oh, this part of the brain is useful in emotional response for love, and this part of the brain is responsible for emotional response for hate. Because you know, people, people sit in these scanners for half an hour, get seen visual images, and then they get angry, or they feel loving feelings, and different areas of the brain light up. It's kind of like fun. A lot of people do good, interesting research with fMRI. Um, we didn't actually cover this PET thing, so I'm going to let it be. This was covered last year in detail, but we haven't covered it this year for you to be able to do this question. So we're going to skip that. And then let's do, what is the motor homunculus? I think we had covered this in parts of the brain. We did? We did. Yeah, we did, yeah. It's kind of tricky because the content change from last year, this is have to make sure we covered it. Yeah. Correct. Yep, that's it. So if everyone heard it, it's just the parts of the motor, like the, the organization in the motor cortex corresponds to different areas of the body at different points. So, you know, you can, you, you can each, like the finger maps to a certain area, the leg maps to a certain area, and so forth. Um, the pernicious anemia, which actually we haven't covered because it's in heme, but let's just say nutrients necessary for myelin formation are not there, okay? And you know what myelin is, right? The covering of the neurons. So this 
disease will affect which one? White matter, gray matter, astroglia, microglia, or A and B? Yep, white matter, because that's what white matter is. Neurons covered with myelin. If you can't form myelin, well, then you get uh, issues with that. Name the four lobes of the cerebral cortex and one function of each. You want to take turns and do it? Someone say one. Perfect, okay. So yeah, so if you wrote occipital and vision, you would get full credit for this. So that's why these questions are kind of, you have to write something, but not essays. We don't expect you to write like large words. Occipital vision would give you two points for that. Anyway, next one. Yeah. Okay, that's correct. Any other one? Yeah. Okay. And I, th I think temporal is hearing. Yeah. <laughs> You would get the point for naming. Parietal, what does parietal do? Uh, yeah, sense of position, spatial awareness, language, speaking, understanding words, speaking words, and then sensation. Some of the sensory cortex falls under parietal cortex. And then temporal does um, audio, memory of audio, visual experiences, hearing, mood, memory. So lots of functions. You can say any one, and if it's right, you'd get point for it. Uh, describe three symptoms of for each of each for schizophrenia and major depression. And what brain structures show physical changes in these disorders? So the brain structure question is a little bit tricky and hard, and it's kind of like dig through the slides type of thing, but at least the clinical symptoms we covered in detail. So anyone wants to describe what a schizophrenic patient looks like? Hallucinations, okay. Visual and auditory. Paranoia, good. Delusions. Disorganized speech, huh? Rapid mood changes, yes, okay, fair. Usually they can be even flat, so it's not generally rapid mood change for them because they have negative symptoms, remember? Negative symptoms are like all the A's, like they don't have any affect, they're just like blunted and you know, just like saying horrible, sad things in a strange like monotone voice without any modulation at all. But the stuff they might be saying might be really crazy sounding without any expressions. Okay, and then depression? Sleeping a lot or sleeping too little. Eating a lot or eating too little. Difficulty concentrating, losing pleasure in things, guilty, guilt, feelings of guilt, hopelessness, suicidality. So there's so many things. If you write three of them, that should be enough. And the part actually that this question is referring to is the hippocampus. Over time, both decrease in volume in these diseases. Yeah. They enlarge, yeah, correct. The Nernst equation, this was actually one of your homework questions, and I think all of you got it right, so I don't feel like going over it again. But I think, you remember this? We just changed it to make it a homework question, so I'll skip it. We won't ask you this. If we had asked you this, I would have allowed a calculator, because I can do logs in my head either. We grade it. Uh, Nimit grades the MATLAB, and then we grade the lecture portions and the exams. OK. As far as regeneration is concerned, what is the important difference between the CNS and the PNS? What is the leading hypothesis for this reason? Good. CNS does not regenerate, and PNS can regenerate, given certain conditions are met. And why does the CNS not regenerate? What's the theory? True, that might be one of the things, but what, what is the part of the CNS that prevents the regeneration? Astroglia, good, good. So you guys know all this stuff already. Patients with myasthenia gravis or Lambert-Eaton have similar pres clinical presentations. Why is it so? What is the mechanism of each? I think we've kind of drilled this down with the homework as well. Um, but basically, they cause muscle weakness, right, in general. They're neuromuscular diseases, so they cause muscle weakness. 
and they're antibody mediated. It's just that one has antibodies to the calcium channels presynaptically, one has antibodies to the acetylcholine receptors postsynaptically, and then um, you read the detailed explanation of the 20 hertz simulation for homework. Like that's the kind of reasoning we might not ask in the exam because it's a little bit advanced, but this much is good enough. This. Well, I think the easy thing is you look at the synapse, right? And you have this presynaptic bulb, and then you have all these calcium channels, and then you have the postsynaptic thing, and you've got these acetylcholine receptor present here, right? In myasthenia gravis, you've got antibodies that bind these and prevent them from working. In Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, you have antibodies that bind this and prevent it from working, right? So in this case, if you stimulate the muscle, if you stimulate the presynaptic area too much, you can overpower this antibody to cause calcium to build up in the cell with increased frequency, right? Because you'll, because it's all stochastic. It doesn't just bind and stay, it moves around too. So you just get more calcium buildup, right? Now, the deficiency in Lambert-Eaton originally is that the calcium doesn't come inside, which means the acetylcholine remains trapped, right? But with high frequency, you get calcium buildup. It's called facilitation. And then you get these vesicles released. And then the postsynaptic is totally fine. So the more the acetylcholine releases, the higher your compound muscle action potential will be, right? Whereas in this case, you have originally, you have a bunch of receptors. And let's say three of them are bound by antibodies. So the first time you stimulate, you can still have one binding here, and you'll get some response. But beyond that, if you stimulate third, fourth, fifth time, there hasn't been enough time passed for any of these sites to be vacated. And so your acetylcholine may build up in here, but all the receptors are full, and the muscle action potential won't rise anymore. So that's why I think for those people who didn't write proper answers for this, I pasted the answer key explanation in your feedback. So if someone didn't get that, let me know, and I can send you the correct answer for that. It's like it's pretty interesting to work so through. Okay, so I know, uh, so just interruption before this. So Srivats is here to do mid-semester eval, mid-quarter evals for the class. So for those of you who are going to leave early at 12, just take a form from him now. For the rest of you guys, we leave the class like seven minutes or something early, and then you guys can work with him with the evals. So if anyone's going to leave early, just take a form and uh, submit it before if you want your feedback to be counted. Um, so the next question is, which of the following EMG results do you expect to see with Guillain-Barre syndrome? Does anyone remember what Guillain-Barre is? What is it? So it's basically autoimmune demyelination of the peripheral nerves, which causes a rapidly ascending and can be fatal paralysis uh, if not corrected, right? So in this case, it's a d disorder of the peripheral nerve. So you do an EMG on these patients, and you have three things. You have the conduction velocity of the nerve, the compound muscle action potential, and the distal latency. And then you've got these five choices. So what will happen to the conduction velocity if the peripheral nerves are under attack? Decrease, okay. So then you eliminate A, D, 
for now, okay? You got B and C left. What happens to the compound muscle action potential? Decrease, so you eliminate C. So you're left with B and E. Now you have to answer, what, what happens to the distal latency? Increase, so B fits completely and you can eliminate E, so you get the answer. B is the answer, yeah. B for ball. Okay, the next question is a true or false. Uh, increasing the diameter of an axon will increase the conduction velocity through the neuron. True or false? True, yeah. The, with the diameter, the velocity increases, with the distance, it decreases with the length. Increasing osteoclast activity will lead to lower calcium levels in the blood. True or false? False. What does osteoclast do? Yeah, correct. It resorbs the bone, which releases calcium in the blood. Uh, give an expression, explanation for the biochemical mechanism underlying summation of contractions as described by the following from the lecture. So this basically shows, for those of you who missed it, so S1, S2 are the two stimulus. If you space them two seconds apart, you get individual twitches. If you bring them a quarter second or so apart, you get a summation that the first one starts twitching, but then you get a second stimulus, it builds up, and then it keeps rising beyond the first. If you give them even closer together, it almost fuses to a single bigger bigger uh, twitch. So what's the underlying mechanism for this summation? And this is called temporal summation because you're bringing the impulses closer in time to cause a bigger signal to be produced. If, on the other hand, I gave you a figure which said, you know, this tissue is being stimulated from here and from here, and the impulse is traveling, and then it's summating at the end. That's spatial summation, because it's coming from different areas in space. This is coming from closer areas in time, so it's temporal summation. So what's the underlying mechanism physiologically for the summation? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Incomplete membrane repolarization, that's a fair answer. What happens, like, otherwise in terms of ions and stuff? which is exactly what you said, incomplete membrane, which, we, which you would have gotten full, credit for, gotten full credit for, but basically calcium builds up so the membrane is not able to repolarize fully, come to its resting state. So the second one, if the stimulus is delivered fast enough, like close enough but not too close for the refractory period of the neurons, then you'll get a higher intracellular calcium concentration causing a larger response. The next question is, Degeneration of dopaminergic neurons is present in which of the following nervous system disorders? I think we've hammered this down several times, but which one is it? Which one? Parkinson's. And which area of the brain? Substantia nigra. Good. So you guys don't even need your cheat sheet. It's going to be just fine. So draw a sarcomere. Label myosin, actin, explain the basic process of force generation. Do you want to draw it on the board? <laughs> so, so it's basically, My, my drawing is really crappy. I can draw better on paper than on the board, but. Okay, so basically you've got, this is the thicker filaments, so you can draw them thicker, and these are myosin, right? And then you have the thinner filaments, which are the uh, actin filaments, which would be, uh, they all look the same. And then you have actin-myosin interaction through connections, right? So the myosin head connects binds to the actin. So we don't have any way to draw the myosin head besides we just like draw these as circles for myosin head and we have that. Um, and you can draw that for all of it to connect the two. So you got myosin head, you got, and then there's the other one which is the squiggly one which is titan. So these are the three things. Now, what component hydrolyzes ATP? It's the myosin head that has ATPase activity, which hydrolyzes ATP to ADP and phosphate. The next part of the question is, what extracellular signals triggers contraction? Now, this is a poorly phrased question, in my opinion, because technically it's an impulse that comes to the neuro, neuromuscular junction, but they are saying that acetylcholine is the 
the signal that depolarizes the postsynaptic membrane, which is also fair either way. And then the interest of the signal is calcium, as you know, right? So the key to remember is that I think muscle contraction is kind of interesting, and we covered it in a few slides, and it's got lots of details in it. But the basic theory is this. You have a impulse coming at the neuromuscular junction, which causes depolarization, right? And because of the depolarization, actually there is membrane calcium channels that also get um, activated at the sarcomere level, so on the muscle fiber level. And these calcium channels open and enter a little bit calcium from outside, right? But we know that the majority of calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which has a ton more calcium than outside. So the little bit calcium causes a ton of calcium release from inside the cell itself. So it's called calcium-induced calcium release, right? And then the muscle contracts. And basically what happens is calcium binds tropomyosin, which clears the head, of which, which basically moves the calcium binds troponin, and that clears tropomyosin, whatever, the theory of this thing, which I don't remember anymore. But basically, that will move the myosin head and leave it free to hydrolyze the ATP, which then kicks the actin, and the muscle, will the muscle fibers will slide against each other to form contraction. So it's a huge, long cycle. And this question doesn't ask you to describe the whole entire thing, but I think the whole entire thing is worth studying. And this question is just doing, um, asking for just the basics. And I think it's the calcium binding the tropomyosin, not the troponin. If I said it cor incorrectly, I'm correcting it. It's calcium binds the tropomyosin. Um, we didn't do aging. Aging is for the final. Let's do the CV system. The following vessel type is a major contributor to vascular resistance. Which one? We actually explicitly studied in class why C would be not the answer. Yeah because of the large number of capillaries that the overall surface area is really large, so it actually has the lowest resistance. So it's which one? Aorta is just one pump. It's like one tube, sorry, not one pump. It's B, it's arterioles, it's in between that. It's tricky because they are the ones that are not that large a number, but they're small enough in diameter, right? So they have, each of them has a higher resistance, but the overall number of them isn't as large as the capillaries, so it actually add, creates a lot of resistance. Uh, you can look at that figure. Remember that oscillation thing that we went through? It actually shows it there. Artery is bigger. Arterioles are smaller. So like, yeah, veins are bigger than venules. So it's aorta. Like, for example, aorta gives rise to like big arteries, right? Like the subclavian artery or something that goes along your collarbone underneath it. That's a big artery. But then that big artery will send out multiple small arterioles to supply all the muscle and tissue and bone and stuff around from that vessel. So that's arterioles. And then fine, inside the tissue, they break into tiny, tiny capillaries that you might not even be able to see. Those are capillaries. And then capillaries connect to venules, which are really, really small. They join to become big veins, like the subclavian vein, and then they join to become the aorta equivalent in the venous system would be the inferior vena cava on the down and superior vena cava on the top. So that would be that. How may mitral regurgitation lead to pulmonary edema? Now you guys should be experts at this because we did heart failure with a patient with severe pulmonary edema. So how does mitral regurgitation or insufficiency lead to pulmonary edema? Yeah. Correct. So you, to explain that to get full credit, you would basically say, this is your left atrium, this is your mitral valve, this is your left ventricle. If you have regurgitation, which means we know that the flow from this valve should be this in normal conditions, and it shouldn't flow from the left ventricle to the left atrium, because when the left ventricle should contract, it should go out the aorta, correct? And there shouldn't be any blood flow back into the atrium. This valve should shut, because it should be unidirectional, ideally. In mitral regurgitation or insufficiency, when the ventricle will contract, then some blood goes through the aorta, as expected, and then a little bit goes back into the left atrium. So this increases left atrial pressure and left atrial volume over time. Now, we know that left atrium receives its input from which one? The pulmonary veins, right? 
That's why I said you need to understand the anatomy of the cardiac system to be able to explain this. And the pulmonary veins go to the lungs, obviously. So if more and more stuff is gonna build up here, this vein is gonna be able to not empty itself fully in there, and there's gonna be backlog of blood all the way from here into the lung tissue causing pulmonary edema. Does that make sense? So the backlog into the pulmonary capillary bed will cause the water to ooze out of the capillaries to cause fluid to accumulate in the alveoli. So the funny thing is, that's the question I would have labeled four points, and I would have put some of the other ones lower. It's just that the sample exam is a little tricky. Yeah. Hydrostatic pressure, because if you have a backup from the left atrium, you know that there was an equation about hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure, and there's a filtration equation, right? I think it's in the renal lecture, but that applies for all vessels, not just renal vessels. So if you have too much hydrostatic pressure or hydraulic pressure, you're gonna push out that water in. What keeps the water in the blood, blood consists of water, like a lot of water. So what keeps the water in the blood is proteins and stuff. But if the hydraulic pressure increases too much, they're gonna just let the water out into the capillary, or from the capillaries into the alveoli. Does that make sense? Why there's a backlog? You know, you can explain it just, just with the simple diagram or with words and either of them should be fine. The next question is kind of simple and we can do it if you want. We didn't really cover EKGs this year at all because I felt like it was too advanced and we wanted to focus more on physiology. So, but basically normal resting heart rate is between 60 and 100. They're telling you to comment on the heart rate and rhythm from the following ECG strip. You do not, we do not teach you how to comment on rhythm, so forget that. But to compute heart rate, it's actually fairly simple. You can see the time between the two impulses, and it's 0.2 seconds for one small box. So the calculation in this case would just be about 150 if you work it out based on how, how far apart they are occurring. But you don't have to do this. This is not covered this year. Let's do the next one, which we surely did cover. How does blood flow across uh, a blood vessel change when its length reduces by half and diameter reduces by half? Do you guys know which equation to use? Now that's where the cheat sheet would be helpful if you wrote down your equations, you could just apply it. This is the kind of equation stuff that you will be asked to do an exam, but it's not like a crazy derivation of anything. So you said, so it's diameter by half. The equation has radius. And it's, sorry, it's, it's r to the four, not r to the, r, it's r to the four at the denominator. So it's actually L increases the resistance by twofold. The diameter decreasing by half increases the resistance 16 fold. So decrease twofold, increase 16 fold, the net is an increase of eight fold. And I think he's drawing it there. Yeah. So this one would be eight L by two pi R four by 16. So 16 and two will become eight. So next one is at which point uh, why is the point at which the iliac arteries emerge from the descending abdominal aorta a common location for atherosclerosis? I think we, I brushed over this because I gave that lecture, so I know I didn't cover this in full detail, but I remember telling you guys that aneurysms happen along bifurcations and also the common sites of, sorry, aneurysms, uh, atherosclerosis happens at the site of bifurcations, and iliac is like the major site of bifurcation at the aorta lower down because it's what supplies the lower extremities. So that's the reason because it's a branching point, but it's not a, it's not a big... Uh, point. And branching points basically mean turbulent flow when you think of Reynolds number, and I think we spoke about that. So, this one, uh, refer to the following diagram, which is the PV loop of the left ventricle. What is the heart doing at each of the following transitions? What is the heart doing between one and two? So, think about it this way between one and two, the pressure is increasing, but the volume is remaining the same.
Not yet, because the aorta is closed. If the aorta was right. open, uh, the aorta contraction, so it's isovolumic contraction, because the valves are all closed, but the heart's contracting. So the pressure rises, but no blood is able to flow out yet. Then at point number two, the aortic valve opens, right? So from two to three, what is the phase? Yeah, so it's ventricular ejection or pumping into the aorta. Then from three to four, your pressure is decreasing, but the volume is staying the same. So it's the opposite of one to two. Instead of isovolumic contraction, it's isovolumic relaxation. So the valves are closed, but the heart muscle is relaxing after beating. And then between four and one, what happens? Fill, it's ventricular filling. So that's it. Next one is an interesting question. I really like it. How is spontaneous pacemaker activity generated in excitable cells? Which cells in the heart have pacemaker function? And how do they differ? So we talked about two kinds of action potentials in the cardiac lecture. Do you guys remember those figures that I drew? One was like this, and the other one was kind of like that with a slow rise, and it was much higher resting potential. Remember that? So in case of pacemaker cells, which is that one, there's a slow positive rise in action potentials, and that fires and then decreases and then rises again. And, then, and we thought that was under nervous system control using like acetylcholine and parasympathetic nerves like the vagus nerve, which, which dictate our resting heart rate, right? And so these slow positive things uh, are basically by leaky channels. We said that ions keep entering by themselves, and those leaky channels are under the control of the parasympathetic nervous system through the vagus nerve. And um, so basically, that's how the rhythmic pacemaker cells work. That's the first part of the question. The second is, which cells in the heart have pacemaker function? Which ones? SA node, AV node. And then there's like other folks, like junctional foci in the atrium and ventricle, which you can leave. But SA node, AV node, Purkinje system as well has their own firing thing. Now, why does SA node control the heart rate? We, we reviewed that. It's the fastest. The SA node has the highest firing frequency compared to all the other pacemaker cells. So it overrides the pacemaking activity of the others and serves as the pacemaker for the heart. If SA node is damaged, sometimes AV node can take over, and that's, that's when we get various kinds of junctional rhythms because it's coming up from the AV node lower. So this phenomenon, we didn't call, I didn't give you the name in the lecture, but the phenomenon of SA node overriding the other uh, things is called overdrive suppression, which makes sense. So this one, draw two superimposed pressure volume curves covering one cardiac cycle compared to aortic stenosis, comparing aortic stenosis to a normal heart. In this case, I think a fairer question would have been to give you a normal loop and have you just draw a superimposed loop for the aortic stenosis. It's hard to draw the normal and the abnormal. So assume that the blue one was given. Then we know that aortic stenosis causes less blood to be ejected, and heart has to work harder. So you see the stroke volume decreases, right? And the pressure increases. So the loop becomes thinner and taller in aortic stenosis. It's also in lecture, I think. And if you need more explanation, you can go back and listen to the video. I explained that in a little bit more detail. So let's do some respiratory and renal questions in the last five, six minutes. Um, which of the following would you expect to increase in a patient with emphysema? And I think emphysema, we don't have time to cover all the, de all the details of the diseases in class too much, but emphysema is just chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So patients retain a lot of air and become high volume states. So I'll give you the answer, it's residual volume. They just, they just become air trappers, basically. They can't exhale out with good enough strength, so they keep trapping in air. Their chest can become really barrel-chested and very wide and big, yeah. You're right, so D is expiratory reserve volume. Just because you have the air doesn't mean you have the capability to exhale it. So ERV is a functional volume. Okay. So in emphysema, actually, it's pretty poor because they don't have the capability to exhale. So yes, they have more air in there, but the functional residual capacity reserve volumes are all functional volumes. You have to have function to be able to determine what they are. Just because you have more air doesn't mean you have more function, which is the case in this disease. The next question is super important. Which of the following um, is the arterial blood gas of a The following is an arterial blood gas of a patient. pH is 7.2. 
the normal is between, do you want to write it there? Normal is between 7.35 and 7.45. PCO2 is 70, should be less than 40 to 45. Uh, bicarb is 40, it should be between like 18 to 24, I think no, 20 to 26, somewhere in that range. Oh, they've given the normal values, but I'm giving you the range, never mind. But I said the correct numbers anyway. So what condition does the fault patient have? The way I would approach this, I know you've done basic physiology. This is, I think, this is what people are referring to. I think this much you have to kind of know from your old classes because we didn't have time to reteach it, but this will be used in asking questions. So if the pH is 7.4 normally and this patient has 7.2, is he, what kind of state is he in? Acidosis, so that's the first part. Now I have to figure out whether it's respiratory acidosis or metabolic acidosis. So if you had metabolic acidosis, what would your bicarb level be compared to normal? Bicarbonate is negative, right? It's a base, it's like not an acid. Lower. In this case, the bicarb is quite high. So does he have metabolic acidosis? No. Um, his PCO2 is 70, and the PCO2 should be 40 or less, usually 40 around. What, so what's the problem with his respirations? He's not blowing off CO2, so he could be one of these air trapper people that we mentioned from emphysema question. So it's respiratory acidosis, but his bicarb is off too, because bicarb should be between 20 and 26, so what is his bicarb doing at 40? Compensating. So to, because that low pH means, you remember from basic like cell biology or stuff where pH is necessary for protein folding and all that stuff. So if your pH in the body becomes 7.2, it's actually really, really, really bad for you. pH is very tightly regulated in the body under most conditions. So to compensate, the kidney is gonna retain the bicarb to keep its pH high enough so everything in your body can keep functioning. Because literally at 7.1, everything starts shutting down because no proteins are gonna work. So your body will try whatever it can to compensate for the respiratory acidosis by increasing its bicarb. So it's respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation, yeah. Okay, good. So last question, I think. Is it last? Yeah, last two. Which of the following, A or B, represents diffusion-limited oxygen transport across the alveolar capillary interface? Is diffusion-limited oxygen transport normal? So this is kind of difficult. I don't know if I can explain it really quickly in the short amount of time that I have left. But basically, um, in this figure, this is oxygen transport. And diffusion, um, diffusion limited, I think it's asking you diffusion limited, yeah. So it's asking about diffusion limited oxygen transport. So which one of these is normal and which one of these is abnormal? That's the first thing. A is normal, B is abnormal, right? What's the first part of this question? Oh. That's fine. That's the only thing it's asking. So B is not normal. Okay. Which of the four? So both of them are diffusion limited in some. Actually, B is not normal. A is proper diffusion limited normal oxygen transport. So the question is asking which one of these is normal diffusion limited transport, and it's A. Abnormal is B. Which of the following cannot account? Which of the following cannot account for abnormally low oxygen diffusion? So if you increase thickness, diffusion decreases based on diffusion equation. If you, if you decrease surface area, it decreases. If you put an edema, so water is interfering with diffusion, it decreases. But if you have more oxygen carrying capacity, that is you're more hemoglobin in the body, then it should help. So that is the answer, D. Okay, I'll do one more and then we have to stop because I need to, we have to do the evals. So 49, which of the following will increase the GFR? which is a glomerular, glomerular filtration rate. Increase albumin concentration, constriction of efferent, which is the exiting arterial, construction of, constriction of afferent, which is the incoming arterial, or hypovolemia. I don't think we covered this in class. I don't remember, I was there. But basically, if you have the afferent into the kidney, and then you have the efferent, right? If you will constrict this and make this smaller, like make this narrower exit, is actually gonna increase your filtration rate. Because it's just gonna feel like it's getting more net volume because less is leaving out, less is leaving than coming in. But I don't think we covered it, so you can leave that be. But the answer is B for that one. All right, so we have to, 
leave. I'm going to give this to Shriva so you guys can do the evals of the course. I have office hours at 5 today if you guys want to come and discuss any of these questions or the outline that we posted. James has office, had office hours on Tuesday, so email. Yeah. And I think the exam is on Tuesday, and we don't have office hours before then, but if you guys really think you want to meet over the weekend on Sunday or Monday, then email ahead and set up the time. Don't email me the day off. I can't decide my schedule that quickly. But if you email me a few days ahead of time, I can meet with you separately.